morning. Let's take a look at section three. It's a very simple section. It's the components of listening. This reminds me a lot about the section on the perception process. It's very similar. So before we talk about the components of listening, I want to go back to the idea of hearing, that hearing is a physiological process and that really is the first step in the listening process you can't listen if you can't hear the previous edition of this textbook and some other textbooks refer to the first step as selecting so it's basically being able to actually hear a noise or words whatever it could be Obviously, there are things that get in the way of us being able to hear very well. It could be a physiological barrier. I know at one point I had a sinus infection and it was clogging my ear. And whenever students would say something, I'd have to ask them to repeat it and I'd have to turn my head to the right so I could pick up on it. I felt like one of those big TV antennas. All right. It could be background noise. You know how I talk about the, the hum of the projector. Uh, one point they were doing construction at Tungsis and that was having a big impact on how we were able to hear things in the classroom. It can also be auditory fatigue that you have, um, if you've ever been to a concert, you will know that when you leave the concert, your hearing has been diminished. And also this could happen if you have your, this is something I say to my son all the time, he has his earphones on and it's so loud that I can hear it. So if I can hear it and, and I don't have the earphones on, imagine how the, the damage it's doing to his, his own hearing. And that's an example of auditory fatigue. So the second component of listening is attending. This is a psychological. Remember, the first one is physiological. And now this one is psychological because we are making a decision consciously or unconsciously what we're going to pay attention to and we know that we really pay attention when we believe there is a payoff. Um, I know that what, at one point when I was doing some some work in a, a factory I was asking people if they read signs that were on the bulletin board and they only said they would pay attention if there was a dollar sign. So there's something similar when we're listening. If we hear a word that's important to us we will tune in. So back to the idea of attending, if you are a skillful, skillful communicator, you're listening or you're paying attention not only to the words, but also the nonverbal cues, what the person looks like, how, what their body, how their, what their posture is, what their tone of voice is. <clears throat> when we listen, when we are attending well, we should attempt to screen out distractions. And some distractions could be uh, phoning and driving. I know we talk about don't text and drive, but you should also not be on your phone. And it, it it's not a question of having your needing both hands on the wheel. It's the fact that when you are listening to something, you're listening to someone on the phone that is taking a lot of your attention and it's taking your attention away from driving. On page 205 of the textbook, there's a sidebar, uh, the dark side of communication, it's called the myth of multitasking. And everyone says, no, no, I can, I can multitask, I can do two things very well. But we know that our brains, I'm quoting, our brains can only process so much information at one time and mo mobile devices provide a distraction that impairs cognitive focus. Studies show that mul media multitasking has a negative effect on learning, studying, and remembering. So research provides clear evidence that mobile media use is distracting with consequences for safety, efficiency, and learning. So think about that. Can you put your phone away when listening is really important? I'm putting on my mom hat and I'm urging you to do that. I'm taking off my mom hat and putting on my professor hat and I'm urging you to do this. Okay, enough of, enough of that. Let's go on to the next component, which is understanding. <clears throat> Sometimes what happens is we've actually 
we've, we've heard the message, we've paid attention to the message, but we're not, we're not attaching meaning to the message. It could be because the person maybe it has an accent that you're not familiar with, so it, that it's difficult, or they're talking about a topic that you really don't understand. That's the syntactic, in, or you know, their 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 syntax is off. They're they're doing that Yoda speak, and and so just because we we believe we're paying attention does not mean that we're going to understand everything that we hear. There's there's um. A CD of African music that I like to listen to and I sing along with it at full volume and I have absolutely no idea what I'm saying. I have heard the words but I really don't know what they mean. So <clears throat> there's a concept that's called listening fidelity and it's looking at how much of what's the connection between what we understand and what the sender is trying to communicate because sometimes you're nodding your head and you think you're getting it and the list the speaker thinks you're getting it but actually there's very little listening fidelity going on okay the fourth component of listening is remembering how much do you remember of what you hear obviously the more times information is heard or repeated the easier it is for you to remember um, and if you've rehearsed the, the information, you can remember it better. In the days before cell phones, when someone would share a phone number with another person, if we didn't have a chance to write it down, one of the things that we would do was say it over and over and over again until, and, and not just in our heads, we'd actually say it out loud. So we would, we would hear it and we'd be more likely to remember it. I think it's fascinating and a little horrifying that we hear something and immediately for most of us, we only remember 50% of what we heard. Go eight hours, we only remember 35% and in two months, we're down to 25%. So think about this in terms of your own education. Let's say you have a class where the teacher lectures and you have a midterm and a final. How are you going to remember the information that you learned in, in, in those, you know, month and a half, two months? Because you know that just by hearing it, you're not going to remember. So I would say writing things down helps. Um, getting together with other speaker, other listeners in your class would also help because you can pool your information. The last component of listening is responding and the next section a very long section is going to tell us all different ways that we can respond but basically if you are a good listener if you are an effective listener you need to show the person who's speaking that you are attending you are paying attention to them and you can let them know non-verbally through eye contact and appropriate facial expression and you can let them know verbally by answering or asking questions and exchanging ideas. If you remember back to the very first chapter, we had that, again, the Stewie Griffin model of communication. Oopsies, sorry about that. We know that communication is transactional. It takes two. As I'm sending you a message, you're sending a message back. So we need to show each other that we are listening. And thus ends the lesson for the moment.